All altars are what? Places of covenant. You feel like you're in Bible school today? All altars are places of what? Covenant. Uh, Genesis 20, 22, verse 9. And then we're going to jump to verse 15 to 18. Genesis 22, verse 9. And we jump to verse 15 to 18, the new, uh, the Amplified. When they came to the place of which God had told him, Abraham built an altar. What did he build? The first thing. There, and he laid the wood in order and bound Isaac, his son, and laid him on where? The altar on the wood. So what was the, what was the offering? Isaac. Isaac was put on the altars, right? You get what I'm saying? Isaac will, will be the sacrifice of the altars because all altars are raised by sacrifice. You can't raise an altar unless there's a sacrifice that raises and then from that she begins to speak. And you have to sustain it by sacrifice. Okay? Are, are, are you with me, somebody? So watch this now. Verse 15. We jump to verse 16 now. Then the, Lord of the, then the angel of the Lord called to Abraham from heaven a second time. Now we're about to see the exchange. After telling him, don't kill your son. Is that right? Now we know you fear the Lord. Now here's exchange. And I said, I have sown by myself, says the Lord, that since you have done this and have not withheld from me. Notice, Abraham was never told what the exchange would be. He was just told what to do. God always keeps it surprising. God always keeps it interesting. If you want to know before you obey, you're going to miss this God of ours. Now I know. <laughs> or, or begrudged. You, 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 you did not withhold from me. Or begrudged giving me your son. Your only son. In blessing, I will bless you. Oh, karabu shata. You know what it means? It means in blessing, I'll bless you means. What I'm blessing you. I'm blessing you for the car. Uh, then I remember, do you have a house? No, I don't. Oh, my house. Okay? And I, then I'm like, do you have furniture? <laughs> In the blessing, before I, before I finish one blessing, another one has begun. <laughs> In blessing, I will bless you. <laughs> In multiplying, <laughs> while I'm multiplying, come on somebody. Your God portfolio, I start to multiply your silver. What I'm multiplying your silver, what about like, ah, in multiplying, I'll multiply you. That's why you, can, that's why you don't understand the blessing of Abraham. Ah, in multiplying, I'll multiply you. This is how I'm multiplying you. Like the start of the heavens, and, and uh, you, you, uh, uh, it's, uh, I'll bless you. I'll multiply your descendants like the stars of the heavens, like the sun of the seashore, and your seed, the hare who possess the gates of his name, enemies. And in your seed, Christ, shall all the nations of the earth be blessed by him, uh, by, blessed by him, uh, uh, and, bless, uh, and bless themselves because you have heard and obeyed my voice. Okay, a covenant was made. Because, but here's the thing. So covenants are made and sustained by altars. A covenant without an altar is a useless covenant. He has no basis. Oh, by the way, talk to me somebody. Amen? Come on, somebody. Ruda By the way, the marriage bed is an altar. The marriage bed. Is an altar. So a marriage that does not attend to the marriage bed will soon be headed for the divorce court because they are not attending to the what? Altar. If you are married, you can't pray forever. You also have to come to the marriage bed and play. Because if you do not, You'll be praying somewhere else. And he'll be praying somewhere else. And God says, you're both foolish. Even in terms of fasting, the Bible says, even in fasting, agree. Because you must come back to attend to the altar. And the altar of the marriage is the bed. That's why when you bring a woman in that bed, who's not your wife, death is always released because that woman is not holy to that altar. She's common. 
When you bring a woman who's common on a marriage bed, God calls it adultery, fornication, woman, and God will judge. The act looks the same, but it's different. Because the wife is dedicated to that bed, the other woman is not. She's common. Because altars are places of covenant, one day God will surprise you. You're going to come to the altar to pray and God will give you a private covenant. Oh yeah. You don't know about private covenants. You know, a private covenant is a covenant God just makes to you. went and God said to me, by myself, here's what I give to you and this is only for you. And it will follow you all the rest of your life. And he told me, I can tell you, three covenants. Three covenants. Some of you, listen to me, if you follow the Bible, See, yes, there's a universal covenant that we share. But you see, God is a private God too. He's a corporate God, but he's also a private God. One private covenant brought me to, uh, from Africa to America to do the work that I'm doing. God made a covenant with me in South Africa. Or let me, or this one I can tell you. He's given me the free, free to tell you what, what this is. So he told me to give them that one. A friend of mine, oh, a friend of mine from Zimbabwe, okay? Now, this is way before I went to Zimbabwe, and I believe now, thinking about it, maybe that's the reason why God came to Zimbabwe. A Zimbabwean pastor in, in a, it was, was living in Pretoria. I was living in Pretoria. I was an, an evangelist traveling with a big tent at that time. And so I came back, and he, had, he called me. He had a serious problem. His mother was dying that day. They called him from Bulawayo. Your mother... She's holding on to dear life because you are the firstborn son and she wants to see you. She says, I want my firstborn to close my eyes. My son must come. So the family says, whatever you do, your mother, she's tough. She, know, she says, she, the, the, the daughters don't know why she's still alive, but she skips every time she has conscience and she says, where is my son? I'm waiting for my son to close my eyes. He was the firstborn man of God. And he called me crying, my mother. But she, she's holding on. But there is no amount of driving, even if I drove like a crazy maniac, could get me in amazing time, in the hours to go and do it in Bulawayo. I need to fly there. But man of God, I have no money to fly to Bulawayo and go and be there. I just called you for prayer because I know you're a man of prayer, Francis. And we said to pray. Now because I'm a prophet, the prophetic gift comes. And the word of the Lord comes to you. There is a man who has the exact amount of money that you need. And God is touching that man. And within the hour, you'll be paying your ticket. And where I see you in the room of your mother's hospital, and you're closing her eyes, she'll be dead within the a few minutes. She'll be dead. Just, she'll be dead within a few minutes. She'll be dead in a few minutes once you, you, but you get to talk to her and yes, you will close her eyes, my son, saith the Lord. It was powerful. I felt good. I put down the phone. He thanked me. I put down the phone. I'm feeling good. I'm feeling like, a, like Kim Clement. <laughs> Prophet. Amen. So I put on the phone and then I heard the voice of the Holy Spirit. Son, you are right. I'm touching a man. <laughs> I, I've, you know, I'm touching a man. And he, then he says, Thou art that man. Man, I began to, I, I went into serious tongues. To bind this spirit. <laughs> man, I was up. I said, I can't be the man. I ignored, you know. I 
I, I, mean, I, I can't pray. I mean, I thought praying in tongues would, would, would release me from this. Which is really foolish because when you pray in tongues, you talk directly to God. God said, you're talking to me. God said, you're talking to me, boy. Because <laughs> I wanted this voice to, be, to disappear. And the more I prayed in tongues, it became louder. And then, I began, then my tongues began to lose their energy. There's, Lord have mercy in Jesus' mighty name. They became English words now. <laughs> I began to interpret. Lord, forgive me, Lord. I'm, I'm so, you know? <laughs> you know? And then all of a sudden, I was angry. I even had a Zimbabwean friend. <laughs> so if I just never did me as a friend. You would not have caught me. I would not be in these problems. <laughs> I hated him for a little bit. <laughs> so finally... When I realized I was not getting anywhere, I said, oh, Lord. You know, and he said to me, Francis, what did, did you not say the man who has the money <laughs> has the exact amount this man needs? You know, he says, okay, now you'll laugh about it because right now I laugh about it because that's money I now used to for taking people to lunch and actually more than that. But at that time, it was like a million dollars. It was only 1,400 rands. That this was 1996. Looked like a lot of money to me. At the time, especially when I was, if the, if I, because at that time I had not yet conquered poverty. <laughs> it was a constant cousin. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> so, <laughs> $1,400 runs look like a million dollars in the US. Ah! And I'd worked so hard to save that money. Because I'd check him. And sure enough, it was 1400 He said to me, Give him the money. Write him the check. That's when I realized God doesn't really. I realized God takes both cheerful and miserable givers. <laughs> <laughs> he takes them both. <laughs> I was now. Now watch this, because that's the problem when you have too much Bible like me. It messes with your head. So. I was, so I started to write. Then something popped, an idea pops in my mind. A revelation. I say, oh, God could be treating me like Abraham. <laughs> so, I'm, somewhere when I'm writing, I hear a voice. Now I know that you fear me. <laughs> so I said, you know, this check cannot be written out quickly. I need to give God time to... Sp so I started writing slowly. <laughs> this money, I'm like, Lord, you can speak any time. <laughs> I'm writing the check for whatever, you know. But then something happened. When I started signing it, the Shekinah glory hit the place. Bam! It was heavy. It was heavy. All fear disappeared. I'm just shaking. And then the audible voice of God spoke from the shaking out. Because you have done this, I now create a link between this nation, this continent, and the country of your ultimate assignment. And then, I had in, as I said, assignment, a vision opens up. And I see a bridge across waters. I know this Africa does not have a bridge like that. It was across water. And I saw another island, tall buildings, and this bridge with water everywhere. Green. I look, and I found myself standing on top of it, in, in the middle of it, looking at the city. And God said to me, because of what you've done, I've made a connection. I've sworn to you by my own name. I'll get you the country of your heart made assignment. And the glory disappeared. The voice was gone. I'm crying. I called my friend. Come and get the money. He came. He got the money. He, everything I prophesied happened. He walked in the office. A few minutes he talked to his mother. And he was the one who closed her eyelids. And she was gone. And then two years later. No, one year later. I'm sitting on a table with a man of God called Apostle Simpson in Israel. 
We called him the Lion of Africa. He used to he could preach before before there was a TD Jakes, there was Simpson in Israel. This man would just be the brother, what are you doing? But when he starts to preach, you'll be taken off your shoes. Ah, I'll take my shoe as well. Ah. He could preach. And he preached deep word. He had a big church. And I just met, managed to meet him. So to me, I was just a small man compared to this man. But on the table, he takes a liking to me. Young man, I like you. My spirit just likes you. Then I think, okay, okay. Yeah, thank you, sir. Thank you, sir. He goes back to his church. I get a call from his secretary. Apostle Simpson Ingezela wanted us to call you. He wants you to come and speak for his church. He had 3,000 members. What? He wants you to come. And by the way, bring your team. We are all putting them up in hotels. Wow. First time it ever happened like that. My team. We just, yeah, all your team. So the whole team went. Then I, went, then I preached. Then at the sun, and then after Sunday service, went to eat. He said, young man, I don't know why I'm telling you this. Have you been to America? I said, no, sir. God is telling me to help you get there. Just like that. Really? Yeah. I'll arrange your itinerary. I go to the U.S. a lot. And he arranged my itinerary to the U.S. A man I just met like this. I met a change change around. And then he got me booked in Brooklyn, New York. I flew to Brooklyn, New York. The pastor picked me up. We got to his house, Lever Nicholson. They've got a great church. But that's but that's other day. The, the the New York Mets were playing the Yankees. I think it was in the series. Oh, you need to go. Raymond, he was a big Mets fan. Let's go to watch whatever. So he gets me in the car. I've never watched baseball, which was my first time. And we're driving. When we got to the Brooklyn Bridge, my heart stopped. Ah, stop! It was the exact bridge and the city of Manhattan over there. Everything I saw. And God said to me, did I not make a covenant with you? This is the country you are called to change. You never know the covenant an altar will give you when you least expect it. A private covenant. Private covenant. God made private covenant with Joshua. That he never gave. Uh, no man who shall be able to stand before you. It was a private covenant. Private covenant. You apply to you. You'll be shocked. Other people will be able to stand against you. I, I don't know. I was standing. No. It was made to Joshua. Private covenants are available. I don't know what I'm talking to, but some of you, the Lord is about to make a private covenant with you. One of these days, you come weeping. I know. See? And you know why? Because one day, he's going to be waiting for you. Not to give you money, but to give you a private covenant. That's just between you and your God. Let's close this. Man. Where are we? Number what? Number nine. Number what? Really? Okay. All authors can hear. Number nine. All authors what? They can what? Hear. First Kings 13 verse 2. The man of God cried against the altar by the word of the Lord. Altar, altar, thus says the Lord, Behold, a son shall be born to the house of David, Josiah by name, and on you he shall what? Offer the priests of the high places who burn incense, and men's bones shall be burnt on you. The evidence of hearing is accurate what? Response. So if you read that passage, in, but then when you get to verse 4, the altar did exactly what the man of God said it was to do. It was to, be, it was to spread apart and the ashes were to be poured out. The altar spread apart and the ashes were poured out. Altars can what? Hear. That's why be careful what you say around an altar. Altars can hear. Amen? Number 10. Number what? All altars either have God or an idol that is worshipped on the altar. All altars either have what? God or an idol that is what? Worshipped on the altar. Genesis 2 verse 7. Genesis 2 verse 7. Then the Lord appeared to Abram and said, I will give this land to your posterity. So Abram built what? An altar there to the Lord who appeared what? To him. I, so, so, so therefore, at the altar Abram built, who was there? Who was, who was being worshipped at that altar? The Lord, is right? Okay, so a righteous altar, who is worshipped? So who is worshipped at the righteous altar? 
God. Because every altar has either a God or an idol that is being worshipped on an altar. 1 Kings 11 and verse 7. First Kings what? And, and verse 7. Then Solomon built a high place, a what? For Chemosh, the abominable idol of the Moabite, of Moab, on the hill opposite Jerusalem. For Molech, this is, the, this is what's behind Prime Parliament with Molech, the sacrificing of children. For Molech, the abominable idol of the Ammonites. And he also did so for the, all his foreign wives who burnt incense and sacrificed to who? Their gods. This is why tonight will be important because some of you, you have got uh, forefathers who I who worshipped idols or built evil altars in their soul or in actual reality. And the enemy is claiming you pay the lien or the taxes of that engagement. But we are going to shut it down tonight by the Spirit of God. Amen? 11. Law number 11. All altars, what did I say? Oh, sorry. 11 is, sorry. 11 is spiritual warfare is the result of two opposing altars standing side by side. This is a huge one. This will explain why some of you just got a new job and already there are people fighting you. It's not you. Don't take it personal. The altars in them have recognized the righteous altar in you. And the battle of altars will start whether you want to fight or not. That's why God said, do not be unequally yoked in marriage. It's not because, talk to me somebody, it's not because, are you what I'm saying? It's not because if a Christian marries a non-believer, a man who's not a born again, there's no place, doesn't mean you're not going to go to heaven. Nothing to do with heaven. God is warning you what's going to happen. You're going to have a miserable marriage because he may like you, you may like him, he may look handsome, whatever, but if, it doesn't, if, Jesus, if, if Christ is not who he bows down to, He's bowing to something else, whether he knows it or not. So when you marry them, the altars will start fighting, then the individuals will start fighting. We, we had a good time, but as soon as we said, I do, we were fighting every day. Yeah, because the altars are already fighting, so now you, the, the attendants to the altars must fight. They take sides. They don't even know what taking sides. So it's rather marry another believer who's attending to the same altar of the Lord. That's what it's about. Look at, look at, uh, 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 the, watch this, the first Samuel 5, verse 1 to 2. I, I went into the house of a very rich woman in Pitota, very rich white woman. Her husband was the richest man in that province of, um, um Nelspray, one of the richest men on sharp. Oh my God, this guy was, this house had money. And I was asked to come and stay in that house. Well, she went to a church of the pastor, but the guy never went there. And when I was there, the woman started crying. This woman was surrounded by beauty, money. She drove expensive bins. And then she broke down. Cried like a baby. I said, Madam, what's up? What's this story? She says, I'm a miserable woman. I said, what do you mean? He said, the Lord told me not to marry him. But I thought I loved him. I knew he was not saved. And he lavished me with gifts. And I, I thought I could change him and bring him to Christ. But all that has happened under this marriage is fight. The more I try to bring him to the Lord, the further he walks away from it. The marriage is miserable. Now he doesn't even touch me. Blah, blah, blah. And I'm listening to this. Ah. Surrounded by opulence, gold. Hey, at least I was that money, eh? Talk to me, somebody. Have you ever slept in a bed? Amen? The bed looks so good, you feel like just standing and just <laughs> <laughs> sleeping like this next to the bed. Because ah, it's just, that's what happened. And she cried. I did, not, I did not know this law of altars. I would have told her what was happening. You know, you know what happened? As soon as she married him, whether they, the, whether they both wanted it or not, the altars know the law of an altar. When an altar, when the ark of God is placed to Dagon, we don't have to say fight. They'll fight anyway. There are two opposing orders from two different kingdoms. 
The, Phar the Pharisees never thought, no, they never thought Dagon fight with the altar of God. All they did was put the altar of God next to Dagon. God says, you, God says, you, this is not going to work. <laughs> 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 Look at this. Look at this. First Kings, uh, first Samuel, first Samuel, chapter 5, verse 1 to 2. The Philistines brought the ark of God from Ebenezer to Ashdod. They took the ark of God into the house of Dagon and set it beside Dagon, their idol. Okay. When the day of Ashdod arose early on the morrow, behold, Dagon <laughs> had fallen upon his face on the ground before the ark of the Lord. And the Lord said, please take that picture for Facebook. <laughs> So they took Dagon. They didn't understand what was happening. So they didn't understand that the back they, have, they had violated the law of an altar. Altars cannot stay together from two different kingdoms without fighting. Without fighting. That's why when two people get married, it's not just a marriage of two people. Sometimes it's a marriage of two family altars. And if you don't deal with the family altars, they will rise. Are you getting what I'm saying? You know what I'm saying? So, and, and, and if your husband has not been trained, has not listened to Dr. Francis Mouse, <laughs> talk to me, somebody. You know, the, hus the wife can feel something is fighting her. Maybe the altar, then maybe the family, maybe, are you know what I'm saying? Maybe the, bro when maybe the brother carries a family, uh, uh, carries what? Uh, 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 an altar of, uh, an altar of infirmity in the bloodline. Now you get married. And all of a sudden, the wife is always sick. I don't know. Then she says, honey, she's what? I'm looking for prayer. Honey, what? 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 Ever since we got married, I don't know what it is. I'm always sick. Are you saying I'm a witch? <laughs> uh, no, honey, that's not what I'm saying. You just said it. Ever since we got married, are you saying me? I made you. See, now the otters are fighting. Because the man's band lacks knowledge of how altars operate. That's not what she's saying. But it's a reality. Oh. Tonight is important for you. Look at the, So they didn't understand what was happening. So God was going to send a message that's clear and final. Verse 3. They put him back again. Give me a bit. They went there. Okay, but when they arose early the next morning, what happened? This time God went to ISIS on Dagon. <laughs> when Dagon had again fallen on his face on the ground before the ark of the Lord, and his head, that's ISIS, cut chopped off. His head and both the palms of his hand were lying on the floor. <laughs> Only the trunk of Dagon was left. <laughs> God is like, I tried to tell you politely when I put him down. I tried to tell you. But you put him back again. I couldn't stand him, so I just broke him this time. <laughs> Do you know why God schedules men in to come into your life? Like me, like Bishop Dong? It's because sometimes God wants to change the tide of the battle of altars, so he brings a higher altar from his kingdom. That's why I'm here. You're about to be set free. You got a higher altar this weekend. Things are shaking. You see, guys, we need to learn from natural things. Do you know why uh, uh, PSG, you know, Saint Germain, the football club in in Germany? Do you know why they just bought in France? If PSG, do you know why they just bought Messi? Messi, because they understand what Christians don't understand. They want to win a championship. So they went and paid big money to bring in a higher talent. 
God also knows how to import for you to deal with the problems in your life. So God will import even for the weekend a higher altar to shift the battle. Law number 12, let's end it now. I don't even know what time it is. I don't even care. Amen. Amen. Number 12, whoever carries the superior altar takes the day. That's why sometimes you, be, you, you meet certain men or women who have such a place in the spirit of God. And God tells you, tells you, tie yourself to them. What, you know what I'm saying? Let them pray for you or you told you, give an offering to that person. Why? He's borrowing an altar. He knows you are in a fight of your life. And he says, by the offering, you can touch that altar and it will work for you to break what you're fighting. Don't think you have gone to another level. You borrowed an altar. There are two ways you can get delivered. When the higher or when the watch this, this is this is amazing. Oh, this is powerful. I'm gonna explain. This is important for you to get to this. This explained to me so much why you cannot stop climbing in the spirit. Because watch what happens. Whoever has the higher altar takes the day. What does that mean? It means never challenge a witch whose dedication to the altar of Satan is higher than yours. She'll kill you. She'll send you to heaven before your time. But I mean, but I have seen men of God die. And I couldn't say, why would a man of God die before the witch? And God said to me, he explained to me, because God can never talk to you until there's enough revelation to even have a conversation. So when there's revelation and reference, God said, now, you, now let's talk about what you asked about, why that guy died. He says, out of presumption, he rose up against a woman in the demonic world who was more dedicated to Satan than he was to me. Oh. And Satan knew that was a breach. Because Satan ran in the court of heaven like Magic Johnson. <laughs> Lord, I gotta kill him now. Why? You know what he has done? He has breached the law of altars. He's coming up against that witch of mine. Look at her dedication to me. Her dedication to me is higher than his to yours. And why God let it happen? Because he must have said something. God does want to be embarrassed before the devil that he cannot raise people to compete with the same level of commitment or higher. Let me, this is powerful. Now, this is where the power of invocation, he knows the invocation because there's a student in the school. Are you getting what I'm saying? Okay. So, God has thrown me a bypass around it if you're dealing with somebody like that. Okay. The pastor, 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 pastor Paul says, do not think of yourself more highly than you ought to because it will kill you. Because you, if you think yourself more highly than you ought to, you will violate the 12th law of an altar. You're going to use your presumption to think you, you can deal with any principality in the demonic world, but what altar are they standing on and what sacrifice have they given that altar that you have refused to give to your God? Can I prove it to you? I never understood why God... Are you catching what I'm saying? Let me show you this, and I'm ending with this. This is huge. Tend to your master neighbor. Never stop. Strengthening your altar. Let it keep growing stronger. Let it keep what? Let it keep going stronger. Why? Okay. Let's, I'm going to give you a, a, a talk about Elijah to, to close it, but let me give you another non, a, a natural analogy. I've never used it. God just gave it to me right now. You, I mean, no boxing. Boxing. Is that right? In boxing, 
you can fight out of your rank. So you could be Sugar Leonard, Leonard's, one of the best boxers, but you can never fight the heavyweight because it's not your realm. <laughs> if you want to fight a heavyweight, you have to fight him. You have to, if there are certain conditions you must meet for the boxing association to move your class. Because if you change a classifications of boxing, you are violating the law of altar ass. Are you know what I'm saying? So that's why you find when, when, when boxers want to change ranks, they know they study the qualifications. If they need to get fat, they get fatter. They need to get more muscle, they get muscle. If they then wait, they get everything. When they have, then they can go and say, I have qualified to change classifications. I have put myself through all of these regal exercises to just to change classifications because I want to be a heavyweight boxer. I don't want to be a lightweight. Talk to me, somebody. The good news is, like boxing, you can change ranks as you apply yourself. So every worship service you attend, the author says, I'm getting stronger. Every Bible study, I'm getting stronger. Every offering, the author says, I'm getting stronger. Soon enough, some of the problems you are dealing with now, you don't even pray about. You don't, I, I just, when the authors are rising in you, when the author in you is getting stronger, here's what you don't forget as many of you. Have you noticed, if some of you can just sit, sit down for a little second, you're going to find that there are some problems you use, that used to bother you that are still happening, but don't bother you anymore because you already outrank them. <laughs> Elijah. Elijah. We end with Elijah. And we're going to pray. Amen. 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 I don't even know what time it is. I don't care. <laughs> but it, let me end it. Elijah has one assignment. One of the assignments it was, was to deal with the, the spirit of what? Jezebel. Is that right? But notice how God brings him towards that fine. This is interesting. Elijah comes and he prophesies. There will be no rain. Are you getting what I'm saying? Except that my word. And he addresses that. And then God says, okay now, go to the brook Cherith. I've commanded what? Ravens to feed you there. You know what I'm saying? Do you know how ridiculous, how, how you have to raise your level of obedience and faith to believe a raven can feed you? The stingiest bed on creation. To believe that it can bring it. And so he goes by the brook cherries and has to believe they're ridiculous. But every time you rebuke, but you see, why is God doing this? Because that's how you build a man's altar. You give him ridiculous assignments that require that break the mind to believe. Because any man, you know what I'm saying? Because the so next time you tell him walk on water, he can believe it. <laughs> Because he's been like, Lord, that, really? Yeah. Go to the brook cherries. I'm preparing you. Why? I'm strengthening your altar for your ultimate fight. Talk to me, somebody. I'm strengthening your altar to deal with the Jezebel spirit of the land. But why couldn't he just go directly? Elijah's altar was lower than Jezebel's. He would have been killed. And the proof is in the point of what God does. He says, we'll go to the brook cherries. The brook cherries, he's living there. We don't know how long he lived there. But whatever he lived there, when he left there, he was stronger in his faith in God because the impossible had been happening to him every day. A stingy bed came on schedule. Didn't even have, didn't do, didn't do African time. He kept, <laughs> came on schedule. Talk to me, somebody. Came on schedule and brought meat and fed them prophet. I mean, never broke. And then the brook dried up. Watch this. And God says, now go to Sidon, go to Zidon, for I've commanded a widow woman to sustain you. Here's a problem. The widow woman is broke. Do you know the level of faith and also pride you have to swallow? Because Elijah was already a national prophet. That's like, that's like Bishop Bismarck or T.D. Jack showed up at the widow woman house and telling everybody, telling her, yeah, you know what? Give me some of your money before you eat it, you and your son. Do you know what? If, if CNN got that, 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 that story, <laughs> Jake's is finished. Here is a big, here is a mountain. He, he said, God, that's, 
he goes and then he finds the woman is, is, is at the city of the gate. She's so broke. Poverty is her second cousin. She's already there. And he arrives and she, he, he, she's telling him, I'm repairing a little cake for me, a little cake for me to eat and my son. And then we're going to prepare to die. This is the woman who's supposed to take care of me. Believing that, the foolishness of that, you ought to grow. Any man who can believe God through that kind of foolishness. Amen. You don't know what God is doing with you when he asks you to do ridiculous things. He's building your altar. Why? Because one day God will say, now we're done. Let's go for the altar that has messed up with your family for generations. You are ready now. You are ready to take the crown of your family. He says, go to Sidon. Pastor Elizabeth, why is Sidon? It was not even a Jewish city. You know what Sidon was? Zerapath, Zerapath in Sidon was? It was the birthplace of Jezebel. It was the birthplace of Jezebel. God said, son, if your altar can work miracles in Jezebel's backyard. Hey. <laughs> if your altar is that strong, to work a miracle in the birthplace of the spirit that has now taken over your country, go to Sidon. Sidon, the woman was the Sidonian. She was one of Jezebel's people. Her father was the king of that country. And God sends him there and does a miracle of provision in that woman's life. But it's not over. God allows the son to die. Why? Because, okay, that's good. Now your altar has shown your altar. In other words, all the spirits, in other words, Jezebel's hometown, the spirits, the headquarters of our witchcraft has not stopped you from producing a financial miracle. What do you think she can stop you in Israel? One more thing. Death. The boy died. The boy, the boy dying was the last, the last uh, test. The boy died. God says, raise him from the dead in Jebel's backyard. All that witchcraft, all those spirits cannot stop a man of God from performing a miracle of resurrection in Jeb. When that miracle happened, God says, now you're ready to go and confront the enemy of Israel. He returned back because he had now satisfied the law of altars. He was a superior altar now. And the moment he arrived, he knew he was now the superior altar. He went to me straight to Ahab. The man was looking for him to cut his chest. And Ahab said, Ah, oh, you are Elijah! You are the one who has trouble with Israel! He said, No, you and your, that wife of yours, you are the troubles of Israel. But don't worry. I'm here to rescue the country from your hand and that woman's love. Call your prophets to Mount Carmel. Hey. Yeah. We have an appointment. Yeah. Call your prophets to Mount Carmel. Bring them, all of them. All of them who eat at Jezebel's table. Bring them. All of them, I want their combined witchcraft together against my one anointing. Don't bring me one witch doctor. Bring everybody you have in Cameroon. Bring them. Everybody. Even those who dance towards the, the, the moon. Bring them. <laughs> bring them. Don't even leave one. They said counting. Hey, we're up to 850. Keep bringing them. Make sure. You find all of them. 850 came against one man. What order is this? And they come to Mount Carmel. And Elijah, he sets the rules of engagement. Here's what we're going to do, guys. This is a battle of altars. I'll build an altar. You build an altar. And all 850 with your combined witchcraft. <laughs> your combined witchcraft can come to your altar. Don't worry, you can support each other. Support each other. 
Witchcraft from the north, put it there. Witchcraft from the south, put it there. Every witchcraft, you can put it there. Even the women that dance towards the moon, put them there. <laughs> Why? But you could use what water. I'll let you go first. And then he sat down. And they started. Women like this. Everybody's there. <laughs> what kind of witchcraft? You've never seen witchcraft like this. It was on display. The nation is watching. After six hours, it was embarrassing. Because they would, whatever. So, finally, one of the witch daughters said, guys, do we have laser blades? <laughs> it's now blood time. Blood is the highest sacrifice you can give a demonic altar. 800 bloody people. Whatever. And fire was not coming. Why? Because whosoever carries a superior altar carries a day. Elijah knew nothing's going to happen. Now watch this. Why did they agree? Why did they agree to that challenge? Is because they produced fire with, with witchcraft before. This was common. That's why they never said, oh, this is fair. They had already done it. Otherwise, they, said, no, that's, they had already done it before. But this time, every incantation, every chanting, everything they knew, every aura of magic they knew, from whatever in the, they knew it from, bam, whatever, whatever fetishes, everything they could do. Elijah, Elijah came, came around. I have a revelation. I think your God is sleeping. It's been a while. That you guys have a cell phone. You, might, you need to text him. Because this is getting embarrassing. It's been 10 hours. He might be having a nap or he ate too much. You know how it is. He was having fun with it. Why could Nate not produce fire? Because they could not do it when Elijah was there. <laughs> he had fulfilled the law of an altar. He was a superior altar. And it took going all the way to the Brook Cherith, all the way to Sidon, and coming back to get there. Now we knew he was ready. That's why incremental obedience leads to massive breakthroughs in the future. Amen. The problem with you, you don't honor incremental obedience. You want to become Francis Miles now. You don't know 29 years of incremental obedience. That has brought me to a place where governments can be arrested by my presence. Talk to me, somebody. Turn to your neighbor and say, neighbor, neighbor. Do, not do not despise the days the of, incremental of incremental obedience to God in small things. God, God has, a has a plan to build your altar, build your altar to, such to such a level until you can take the title, until you can take the title for your family.